The best thing from having a trade, there's always stuff, as John knows, going wrong with the farm. And when something goes wrong, it's hard to get tradespeople out. They could be days or weeks waiting because people are so busy. Yeah. But at least when I've qualified carpenter myself, the trade under my belt, I can kind of fix stuff straight away. That's kind of one of the big reasons I love it as well because complete switch off from rugby like and I suppose you're so fixated on the moment like and doing exactly what's in front of you. Do you guys listen to a podcast? Did this one actually Thomas Waters, was it? You know, he's yeah. a hurler and he's kind of saying the same thing, you know, if you put up a stud you'd get kind of a sense of pride or like satisfaction with it. Kind of similar to how it is on the pitch as well, you know? Of course. I suppose it kind of scratches that itch a small bit as well. There definitely is a stigma around parents putting their children to farming, even into yeah. trades, whatever it's about. Because once I got the, my papers for a cabin trade, it's like a first class ticket into any country. Because when I got onto New Zealand and Australia, I got a job first thing in the morning. Wow. There's people who go to college there for five or ten years and they go to Australia and they can't get a job in their in their um, degree, they actually go working in construction because yeah. there's actually nearly better money and you can get a job in the morning. But the first the first job, when I went to Cork, I got a new tool bag and everything and I was working above Knock Nahini. And we went back for lunch, we left the tool bag on, on the wall next to the van, came back, and all I could see was a young lad about 10 years of age running down. My new hammer, new measuring tape, <laughs> down the road. Times are absolutely changed, you know, and we, we'd have a lot of disagreements. Like, I want to introduce modern ways into farming and he's, he's 74 years. Yeah. When, once you're used to doing something all your life, you don't want to change it, especially when you get to that age. Welcome along to Under Construction with Chadwick's. I'm Donico Callan, and I'm delighted to welcome you along today. Later in our supplier's corner, we are going to be chatting to Kevin and Neil from Velux. But today we are looking to take a different view on farming and looking at trade skills that are required for the modern farmer. And to bring us up to speed, I'm delighted to be joined by Glenn Egan and John Hognett. Lads, how are you? Great. Good, good, yeah. Brilliant. Glad to be here. Yeah, thanks for coming along. Glenn, I'll go to you straight away. Eight generations in your family of farming. It's unbelievably impressive. Yeah, I suppose there's not that many farms around the place to have that long amount of generations, but I suppose... Um, I'm D8 now and we are hill farming in Kerry on the Cork border, Southeast Kerry. So, you know, Gugan Barra, yeah. we'd, we'd be bouncing that in Bellavorne to the left of us as well. So we're farming there. My father's been farming all his life. And will I tell you a brief story? How yes, please. Got... Yeah, I always interested. So once I finished school, I did a trade and went to Cork. Went to Cork, did a trade there for five years. Had a great trade under John Hurley in Bannon Lock near Douglas there. Loved it. Once I got my papers... I said I wanted to do a bit of travelling, so I headed to New Zealand after the massive earthquake in 2011 in Christchurch Yeah, and got on really well there. Spent a year there, great fun, going to all the rugby games and everything. It was nice to get out of Ireland and a bit of good weather. And then I headed to Sydney and was going for the three-month holiday visa, not knowing that I'd stay there for five and a half years. But wow. the very first weekend I went there, met my future wife, Grace, in an Irish bar, so Grace from... West Cork, same as John there, Clannacilty. Good stock. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. How do we lose a good one? <laughs> He's a good land, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But as the Healy race says, we've the better roads, in fairness. <laughs> but it's been five and a half years there and um, worked for myself as a carpenter there and then came home to the farm as my father was getting older and here I am today. Wow. So, incredible. It's, it's gone quick though, so yeah. quick. Time is absolutely flying like. Yeah, we'll flesh it out in a bit. John, delighted to welcome you. Of course, I know you from rugby and what you're producing on the fa- field. But you might give us a little background into, you know, I know uh, from knowing you and knowing the lads, it's really important to you as well, keeping an eye on working the land and doing little bits all the time. Yeah, yeah, I suppose um, my dad, my dad's a carpenter back home in Ross, so I suppose I got a kind of a, a love for it there when I was younger, like when I used to go working and stuff during the summers off and stuff, but um, I suppose when the rugby started getting a bit more serious, I probably haven't had the time to do as much, but um, I get home there as much as I can, really, uh, go work with him and, and help him out any way I can, um, you know, I love doing it and stuff, so. It's kind of enjoyable for me. You you keep your hand in though, don't you? Like, because if anything, look, fortunately I know it, professional rugby nearly pushes you away from, you know, like it's all rest and recovery. It, it is good to see you are mad keen to still get involved and roll up your sleeves. Oh yeah, yeah. And like, yeah, as you said, it's so hard to find time. Like it's such a busy schedule. Do you know, you're playing week in, week out and your body would be in bits most weeks. Like, so it is hard. It is hard to do other bits. Um, but I kind of got a good balance at the moment. I'm doing a small bit on Wednesdays on the day off. Just, uh, you know, uh, yeah. PBC, uh, Dave Burke and them. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I do a bit there. I'm actually after starting a welding course Tuesday and Thursday nights over in Raheen. 
No way. Kind of oh. uh, the Limerick College for Education, if you know it. But yeah, I know. I suppose it's 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 you you do have time off as a rugby player, but I suppose it's kind of hard to make use of it and yeah. just try my best to make use of my spare time now this year. You know, especially yeah. Cause I'm, I'm, I just finished college last year, so. Um, it's good to start something else now again anyway. Absolutely. Look, we're going to flesh it all out. And Glenn, I'll come to you first. It, it's sheep farming now, is it? Uh, like, he, it was cattle before now. I know you're yeah. dipping back into it so a little bit more. It would be mainly a mixture of both with my father's time. So they would have been milking cows by hand when he was younger. But obviously times have changed now. But he had up to maybe 40 suckler cows and he would have he came second in Ireland there in 1970. I know it seems like long, long time ago, but... I remember the 70s. It's fine. John he, won't. <laughs> <laughs> but my father says it every, probably every second day. I Second best farmer in Ireland there before with cows, but we got, we, we got, rid, of the, we got rid of the cows in there and we focused on the sheep. But I actually bought six cows this year again, so getting back into it maybe slowly. We'll see because I'm building a house out on the farm, so... When we're a bit closer to farm now, we can maybe extend the animals a bit more. So, so yeah. Yours is such a traditional Irish story, isn't it? But traveling away must have been good, one for you, but also good for the job you know you're doing, getting more experience. A hundred percent. I suppose the best thing from having a trade, um, there's always stuff, as John knows, going wrong with the farm. Like more, there's more things going wrong than go right usually yeah. on the farm. And the hardest thing I, you'd hear from neighbors when something goes wrong, it's hard to get tradespeople out. They could be days or weeks waiting because people are so busy. Yeah. But at least when I've qualified carpenter myself, the trade under my belt, I can kind of fix stuff straight away. You would be using tools every week. I get the Makita drills out and you definitely would cross paths. But when I did my trade in Cork, it definitely built resilience because I was young. I was only 17. Yeah. And I started out and I wasn't used to taking orders from a boss. So of course. He put a bit of character into me and... Yeah, copped on a small bit so it definitely made, thing, made me bear a character to who I am today definitely yeah. John you would have had a bit of that as well with your dad and you know what I mean working on site and stuff like that You, it nearly prepares you for a dressing room a little bit doesn't it yeah. I know that sounds in a roundabout way but there is the kind of hierarchy and oh yeah 100% in fairness now my, my dad would be pretty easy on me now you know okay. he, he, he wouldn't really give you everything but uh, no I have a good relationship with him like you know he, he kind of understands a lot you know I'd be out you know if I, I was third after weekend or something, you know, after a game, he'd be, he'd be very easy on me, like, you know, and I suppose it's, it's kind of myself pushy, it, like, he'd always tell me to kind of take it handy, but I love great work with him, so it is, it is good that way, and it definitely, a lot of problem solving on a side as well, like, you know, and I suppose it's the same on pitch then, like, you're yeah. always trying to problem solve, so it's good. But that's the point you're touching on there, Glyn just said it, it like, you, you need to be an all-rounder if you're working on a farm, isn't mm. it? it? Like, it's a cross of nearly all the trades. Yeah, yeah, I suppose on a farm, I suppose I wouldn't have as much experience now, but as a carpenter, definitely you kind of need to have a good idea of all the trades because, you know, like this plumbing, you have to look out for electric electricity and all that, you know, and I suppose you kind of have some idea of everything. So when you're putting your joists or putting your studs, you kind of have some idea where everything goes and stuff and try to help out the other lads in as well, you know? Yeah. Glenn, you've taken a real modern view of it, using social media as your channel as well and, yeah. and documenting what you're doing. I suppose, yeah, the last two years. So when we came home first, COVID, and then obviously I was in the farm the whole time during COVID. Farming doesn't stop. You're yeah. farming all the time. So there was a lot of content. I created a page and I started putting up videos with the father and we have a kind of unique relationship. Like a lot of my videos would be myself and the father literally abusing each other. Okay. People, yeah, yeah, they're yeah. The they're, sorry, but they're, they're the most <laughs> popular ones. Of course, of yeah. course, because it's, it's yeah. all of us. <laughs> Whatever about farming, there's, there's no hugs or kisses. Yeah. No farming, <laughs> I tell you. It is. Uh, but yeah, the, I started the social media, pretty old videos and people love to see animals and all that and the countryside, of course. So it kicked off and we bring out a YouTube video every Friday now and it's more, the YouTube was more for the older people who are not on TikTok and Facebook and Instagram. So people in their 50s, when we go to the mark now or go into the village or Kinmare, they're like, oh, I seen your father there. Jesus, that's great. <laughs> My daughter got it up on the phone. You know, they can yeah. get screen it up on the TV, but it's coming very popular. And we kind of brought out merchandise there this year, which is, bit mad really like since I only started but my father's quote in my YouTube videos to hell with YouTube so <laughs> I brought out a t-shirt and it, they saw it over in the first few days like <laughs> Brilliant. but like silly stuff but it, er, people are enjoying it like How important is that for you though to factor that in now to your working week as well because it can be a revenue The hardest thing sometimes 
when you have to get the phone out, the father's like, put away that yeah. effing phone. Like, <laughs> okay. And like, it is hard sometimes. You'll be running and trying to get the phone out and get, because when stuff goes wrong, it's the best content because yeah, people love seeing hardship. Yeah. For revenue things, you'd have a lot of company uh, companies get out, you know, and businesses, but I wouldn't obviously be promoting every business. You'd only promote something that's beneficial to farmers and ourselves. Yeah, of course. So there's definitely avenues to make a few pounds off that. And we're, we're doing okay now the last few months. And obviously you can make a bit of revenue off YouTube and stuff as well. Like, But I'm, I'm still small. I'm only starting out. Hopefully in a few years we'll be better I suppose yeah but do you think about it do you kind of go okay we need to get a, a, a no something? I don't okay. at the very start and I'm still Jesus I start the out yeah. I was like Jesus I need to get this views to be honest now I put up a video and I don't even hardly look at it right until the next Friday's video so okay. if you be at that you be kind of get a bit obsessed and yeah no so I have a young family as well so once I put up the video whatever Fridays or I put up whatever on Instagram once I go into the kids at home that's it. You need to spend time Not with him because Dara's three and a half now and Clara's one and okay. it doesn't seem that long ago when Dara was only a baby like so yeah. time is flying like. Absolutely and you're busy. Yeah. Yeah. John, you're more hampered I, I know from being involved in the circles but social media there is real restrictions not only in what you can put out but even contract wise so it is difficult for you to probably do the exact same and document. Yeah, yeah. And I suppose he does it quite well as well, you know, and we, we, we would struggle that way, right? I know uh, Pete kind of does a bit on the gardening and stuff, yeah. but... Um, Forever. Yeah, yeah, Going exactly. On so, garden. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we won't slag yeah, now. Yeah, we won't. <laughs> no mic. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I suppose maybe someday I might look into in the future, but um, I suppose it's so kind of sporadic when I get a chance, you know, it's kind of hard to kind of mm. put up content regularly. So I suppose I leave it for a while anyway, you know. One of the big things I found was incredible was during lockdown and when you got trapped out in South Africa yeah, at that point. But I remember uh, on one of the WhatsApp groups I was on, it showed you helping out the groundsman. You know what oh, I mean? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I was, um, we, have a, we have a 35 at home in Max Ferguson, but uh, there was a 135 out there. But I, I just said, that'd be funny. I, I, you know, Dad would like the video of it. So I said, for the crack, I just... Get some last video and I drive around, but uh, <laughs> but you actually ended up what I heard, anyways. You actually ended up helping him out a little bit, did you? <laughs> I'd say, <laughs> I knew who that story now. It's probably arms and legs out of that, I'd say, of but uh, yeah. I did uh, I just I caught one strip of grass and that was about it, yeah. but um, yeah, it was more just for my dad, but then I suppose a few fellas put up in their stories, then and you know, I suppose it went kind of from there, but. Yeah, it was mostly just for my dad. <laughs> but the, the, the only one I can compare you with is John Hayes, who, of course, is a farmer as well. And I remember we called into him one day on one of the days off and he was fencing. And I remember kind of going, we've a big game at the weekend. You know what I mean? He's there. You wouldn't believe how relaxing I find this. Mm -hmm. Just And do you find that a little bit? Yeah. A, a switch off? Yeah, 100%. Like, that's kind of one of the big reasons I love it as well, because... Complete switch off from rugby, like, and I suppose you're so fixated on the moment, like, and doing exactly what's in front of you. But, you know, I was listening to a podcast, this, this one actually, um, Thomas Waters, was it? You know, he's yeah. a hurler, and he's kind of saying the same thing. You know, if you put up a stud, you'd get kind of a sense of pride or like satisfaction with it, kind of similar to how it is on the pitch as well, you know? Of course. I suppose it kind of scratches that itch a small bit as well. But um, definitely, the terms are like relaxing and switch off from rugby, I think, yeah, it's massive for yeah. me as well, like. Glenn, do you find that you're the kind of opposite, though, isn't it? You're always on. You know what I mean? That every farmer always is. I suppose that, but what my relaxing thing is, is it go to the gym. Okay. So, as so for example, I since I went to New Zealand, I kind of got into the gym there because I got a bad injury before I left. And I've kind of gymmed most days, if not every second day. So, if things are going bad at home now, just go to the gym, build out a bit of weights or go for a run inside in the treadmill and feel, it's just mental health, but I, obviously the physical fitness as well, of course, but yeah. feel so much better after going to the gym. Yeah. I know I'm getting exercise in the farm, but it's a different, it's for headspace really, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing you say it because uh, obviously I, I, I'm involved in Ireland's fittest family, but what, yeah. something I've learned over the kind of five years of doing it, I, I, I thought at the start, yeah. pick the triathletes, pick the Ironmen, you know what I mean? Yeah. Pick the unbelievably fit CrossFitters. And now I've learned, pick the farmers. <laughs> pick the farmers every tis time. It is a different form of fitness, all right, but like I'm used, to, well used to up and down the mountain the whole time. You You would get physically fit from it, but the mental side of it too, you have to... Like, we'll be lambing there now soon and you'll be up all hours of night and there'll be very little sleep for two months. Like, yeah. you do you do harden. It does harden you up, all right? Of and course. Make you thick skin, but yeah. 
what I notice is everything's broken into a task. So like when you're actually explaining something, when it comes to the farmers, if you say, OK, there's this bit and we need to do this and you break it down into yeah. like moments of a task, they get it. You know what I mean? It's a, a way and it's no bother. Uh, yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. But look, it, it's a great way of life farming, like when you're taking care of animals and all that. But and very, very rewarding, but it is a tough job. But I wouldn't change it for the yeah. world, to be honest. Like. Chat to us about that relationship, working with your with your dads as well. That must be quite unique. With the old boy, yeah. He's, <laughs> a, he's a big hit now with the, yeah. with the online platform now. To be fair, only for him, I'd say I wouldn't be... Ah, it's made for it. It's gold, but it, like it, it's a, a look into our, you know what I mean, what we're about. He's He brings out a story every week of how farming was years ago and stories and people just love it, the old history, like like times are absolutely changing, you know, and we, we'd we have a lot of disagreements, like I want to introduce modern ways into farming and he's he's 74 years. Yeah. When, once you're used to doing something all your life, you don't want to change it, especially when you get to that age. So we'd have a good few run-ins, but to be fair, like we'd have arguments every day. But he's not not a man to hold the grudge. Yeah, and like we get on uh, a house on fire, and it's great. It's great to do the videos because even to look back on and show the grandkids what kind of a character he was like, and yeah. it's even looking back in videos myself, just like I'm glad I made that video just to see it, like yeah. even for our own ourselves, like for yeah, the family, you're like documenting yeah. it for time. And, yeah, like, if you lose the phone, sure everything is gone. Like yeah, so yeah, it is. It's good that way, all right, to be fair. What about you, John? How do you find that from working with your old flip? Oh, yeah, I love it. Like, and, you know, I suppose you get to spend a lot of time with him then as well, you know, which is mm. great. And I, we, we get on very well, like, you know, we'd never have any 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 hassle or anything like that anyway. But uh, I suppose similar to Glenn there, like, he kind of has his own ways, his kind of old-fashioned ways of, say, finding rafters and stuff now, the, the, the length of them and stuff. But I've been kind of trying to teach him a bit of Pythagoras there the last couple of days. So <laughs> it's kind of another way of finding it, so... Uh, with a square and stuff, so he's uh, he's open to it now. And he likes he likes to kind of a few modern ways of doing it as well. But uh, yeah, it, flesh that out a bit for us. So like you're basically saying like there's a new way of doing this, and it, um, like, well, it's not it's not new, but I suppose he'd kind of um, he'd have an old fashioned way of doing it. Like he'd mark it off the wall plate. Whereas you know if you have the span and the ridge height, you can kind of you can find the angle and the length of the rafter. So I suppose it might save him a small bit of time. Like, but uh, you know, I suppose. I was trying to kind of teach him a small bit, but uh, I do all the maths anyway, and he do the markings. So okay, yeah. We kind of we kind of come to some bit of an agreement with it anyway, yeah. like, you know. But Glenn, you must have found that more than anyone. You probably came back with, uh, you know, unbelievable ideas, unbelievable thoughts, and then trying to implement them without, yeah. with still being respectful. That's the hardest thing, I suppose. When I came home first, obviously my father was getting older, like, and we, he was reducing numbers, and like we made a decision to come home, and I started firing out ideas. And he was like, hold on a second, no, I'm still the boss here. <laughs> so he kind of put me back in my box a bit, right? But <laughs> when he handed over the farm to me then, I kind of started implementing ideas and he would 100% disagree with everything. <laughs> just just a lot of old books are like yeah, that, yeah. farmers. But once he's seen it done then, but he wouldn't say it to me, I'd hear him say, "Jeez," because I did a shed when I came home. And he says, why are you doing that? And then... A year after, he was saying to everyone, geez, that's a great job. We should have done that years yeah, ago. Like, yeah, but yeah. he wouldn't say it to me, but <laughs> we'd have a lot of running ins that way. But once they're done and he sees how it works, he's all for it. But he, it's hard to see the clear picture at the start because he's just used to his ways. Yeah, of and course. He just doesn't want to change. How, how it, it, people will be listening and they'll that'll resonate with them. But you know how do you, how do you manage that? How do you like we, as we're saying with a respectful way for how they've done it before? It's it was tough to manage for me to be honest. Yeah. I just went ahead and did with it. Like you obviously have to be respectful, and yeah, but you have to go for it as well. Like he he's very easy to talk to. I suppose after after he settles down, he like look, we might give it a go, but he's slow in doing it. But everyone's different, I suppose. But I suppose just talk about it is the main thing first. Yeah. I suppose is the main thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I suppose my my dad, in fairness, my dad's fairly open minded that way. Like you know, he wouldn't. If you have a different way of doing it, he'd have no problem. But, you know, I suppose once he sees it himself, then and he's happy with it. He's happy. So yeah. he's not much hassle really that way. You know. what, what's the most enjoyable bit? You know what I mean? Working with family. There's uh, the good days when things are going right. Um, Like yesterday, no, we scanned a lot of our sheep, half our sheep. No, we scanned 500 of them. And like we it's very much of a nervous day because it determines how many lambs you're going to have in the springtime. OK. We had a really good scan yesterday. No, it wasn't too bad. And like, yeah. the two of us. After it happened, we had a cup of tea and we were, geez, that was a great, 
this great feeling like when things go right in the yeah. farm like a lot of things go wrong in the farm but obviously in summer days when you're carrying the lambs to the market and you're getting good good money for you know for all your hard work like just good days like that you have great memories and going to the mountain um, catering your sheep if the weather is good and just creating memories but it's great to have the videos of it yeah. all like but but there's plenty of bad days too, I tell yeah, you. Of course, yeah. yeah. And, then, and that's it. It's always peaks and troughs, isn't it? Exactly, yeah. yeah. What about for you, John? Yeah, it'd be similar, I suppose. You know, when when you'd see, say, if we finished the roof or, you know, a few studs inside or something and you see, you kind of see it there done, you know, I suppose it gives you a, a good sense of satisfaction, you know, especially, you know, myself and my dad did that now. And I suppose you'd be kind of, you know, it's nice. It's a nice feeling to say we both did that. And, you know, we're after making a house for someone, you know, and I suppose I can live there and, yeah. Just raise their family and stuff or whatever they want to do with it but it's it's a nice feeling I suppose looking after people like that as well and stuff you know? yeah. how do you park a road though when it comes to family you know what I mean because it, it, it doesn't finish at work it's crossing over yeah. and, and lo- loads of other people get affected by it you know that is true too the only thing about my father we would argue a lot yeah. a lot just probably every day but <laughs> he's a very easy going character he doesn't hold the grudge he'd probably literally after a cup of tea he just go back to having a conversation with you yeah. about it. Whereas I'd be still kind of hot timbered. I'd be like, "Don't talk to me." But yeah. he'd be very easy going that way. All right, but um, obviously, he'd pass on when I go in going home. If I had a bad day in the farm, Grace would be like, "Just relax. Put it put it behind closed doors now. Yeah. Tomorrow's another day." Like, but it's not too bad to be fair. Yeah, John, you? you yeah, you, I don't know. My, my dad can't really get cross, so I'm, okay. I'm kind of lucky that way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, you're lucky, so. Because <laughs> within the dressing room, <laughs> is it still the... Because if there was a row, when I was involved, it was kiss and make up. Is yeah, that still, still on the still, go? That's still going, yeah, yeah, yeah. We haven't had one now in a while. I think, yeah. um, you know, there hasn't been, you know, recently, like the last couple of years, there hasn't been too many, like, you know, Good. to add one, but... Yeah, just Alan Quillen was scoring the face off everyone <laughs> every second day. We with a rule, if you'd a row with one of your teammates, yeah. just not to leave it fester, you had to kiss and make up in the whole <laughs> yeah, yeah, afterwards. Yeah. So, oh, that would end it, right? Yeah, exactly. It would, in fairness, it's a, good, it does, it's a great way it does, to do it. it, like, it, yeah. it I know it seems really... But it, it, it leaves it at that point. But yeah. there's serious discipline in rugby, like I've seen from both yourselves playing it. If there's ever a scrap in the field or everyone gets stuff, they always put the hand out yeah. straight away and it's forgotten. Like, yeah, yeah, other yeah, sports, no one's like soccer. Like, there's no diving in, there's no diving in rugby. Like, yeah, yeah, well, it, it's all changed now, John, a little bit from when I was playing it. I look at it now, man, you're gladiators out there. You yeah. know what I mean? I can't believe how how quickly, you know, I'm out of the game five years, but what you're doing now, it is like all proper athletes, all at a proper speed. Do you worry about that? Like, is that a little bit of your thinking constantly to have something going outside rugby so that when it does finish up for you, you're ready oh, to go yeah. in your... Yeah, yeah, 100% like, is in, I have, um, I actually have a degree in, in P teaching maths from UCC, but Good on you. I suppose down the line, I I could see myself being a carpenter, like, you know, like I was saying earlier, like, you know, I like being outside and stuff and it's it's a great feeling, you know, I suppose having something done and, you know, after building something like, and uh, yeah, definitely something I'd consider, you know, when I finish up and it's something to look forward to as well, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. Chat to us, what, what point do you know that your skill set is limited or, you know what I mean? Well, when for you is it time to, uh, to chat to a tradesman or someone that is you know like it's beyond your skill level and you think I have okay, to put my yeah. hand up here and for example no I try limit myself anything electrical yeah okay um, even with insurances now if there was a fire renting first thing they look at is uh, is there a certified for the even sometimes for the plumbing as well but more the electrical side we're building a house at the moment we're building our family home on the farm oh, yeah. so we're getting the concrete slabs now tomorrow for the first floor and the, hopefully I'll be able to roof it myself Probably do all the carpentry side of that, and maybe tiling and slabbing, and all that. But um, electrical plumbing for the house, we'll we'll get we'll get yeah. uh, sub that out definitely. Yeah, there's no point fooling ourselves. No, no, <laughs> we don't want the house to go on fire. Of course, yeah. Yeah, that well, must yeah. be a nice thing to know that you're doing though. You're like when in your family house, we're going to be forever. That yeah, your blood, g- sweat, and tears are not. Yeah, it, well, it'll take a bit of time now. It'll be a busy, busy year. Like yeah. So, I, could, yeah. I could probably give you a day if you were stuck in a yeah, there you go. Yeah. If, you're, if you're stuck <laughs> I'll take you that's about it <laughs> I have high ceilings you can maybe plaster <laughs> okay. high ceilings I can hold up plaster boards <laughs> that's know, about uh, it I know, yeah. I know your brothers are plasters yeah, they are. Yeah, so you might yeah. give me a day or two as well that's <laughs> true that's what uh, that's where I used to spend my summers hanging around yeah. with them on that side yeah, that's it. tough that's tough the yeah. plastering's tough yeah. tough gig tell me for you same question John you know what I mean when do you or are you in a different mind frame? Do you kind of think at this moment, I have rugby, so 
are you trying to add to your toolbox to try to find a better phrase for it? Are you trying to get skills that you know will cross over when you go back? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like, you know, I, I was kind of, I suppose, saying it earlier that you do have a bit of free time when you're a rugby player. It's just hard to to actually do stuff in that free time, if you know what I mean. So, like I said earlier, with that welding course, I'm just trying to tip away at other skills like, you know, and I suppose go working with the lads, the PPC lads there one day a week as well. Like just keep my hand in the door or my foot in the door. Yeah. Sorry. But um, yeah, just keep kind of ticking over, keep getting experience in it. Because uh, ideally, I'd love to do an apprenticeship, like, but, um, you know, just the way it is one day yeah. off a week, it's just impossible to do at the moment. Yeah. So I suppose I'm just trying to get together as much experience as I can before I retire. So, you know, I'd be in a better place then to kind of pursue it a bit better. Yeah. It's amazing you say that because we were chatting to loads of the hur- hurlers over the last while. We've been chatting to the Limerick hurlers. Mm-hmm. But they're seeing less and less of guys with trades. And I suppose it's different in rugby. Some of the trades are transferable towards making you be a good rugby player, if you know what I mean. Mm. If you're able to, like, the creative skills is one side of it, yeah. but also the general labour and, and, and great yeah, and grind yeah, of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, 100%. Do you think it's something that maybe rugby circles could look to, you know what I mean, educating people and pushing people towards trades? Yeah, yeah definitely, because I know a few lads, like, you know, love th- that kind of sort of thing, like, you know, I know kind of Pete Wood and I and Scandal kind of yeah. does as well, but I suppose it's hard for them to get experience then, you know, because, you know, where do they get experience and stuff like that? You know, I'm only lucky because my dad's carpenter, but I suppose a lot, fella, a lot more fellas would actually like it if they got a chance to do it. But when do you get the chance? Yeah. That's, that's kind of the question, isn't it? Like, It's amazing. When I was in Worcester, um, we had a brilliant kind of educational manager, Lynette Cutting was her name, and she wouldn't allow you in the circle, Glenn, unless you were doing something to prepare yourself for life after rugby. But an awful lot of the lads didn't want to do kind of degrees and stuff like that. But uh, she used to run a bus up to Birmingham every Wednesday for people to do trades. So guys were going up and doing cabinet making, yeah. and, uh, plumbing, different mm. things. Oh, sorry, yeah. yeah, but it was the best crack bus you could possibly on, be oh, on. Like an awful lot of lads used to meet the bus on the way down just because it was a giddy bus, you yeah. know? <laughs> yeah, but there definitely is a stigma around even parents putting their children to farming, even into trades, yeah. whatever it's about. Because once I got the, my papers for carpentry, it's like a first class ticket into any country because you get a job when I got into New Zealand and Australia, I got a job first thing in the morning. Wow. And like, there's people go to college there for five or 10 years and they go to Australia and they can't get a job in their, in their um, degree. They actually go working in construction because yeah. there's actually nearly better money and you can get a job in the morning. But like, it's it's great to have a trade and I'd, I'd only wish if my son or daughter there went at it, either at farming or took up a trade, but they're seriously lacking. Like, And even when I did a trade back in 2007, there was only one class in Cork, whereas a couple of years before that, for the crash, there was like eight. So I'm not yeah. too sure what it's like. It's probably still low now, like, but there's definitely a stigma around it. Yeah. People go to college instead of doing a trade. It, and we were chatting about this. It's probably a parents have a perception, yeah. they, whereas that is not the case no. on sites nowadays. Yeah, yeah. And like when I, I went to college for two months doing construction studies, two months I only lasted because I just wanted to make money. So check the f- Cork Examiner for an ad for a carpenter. I found it and I was making money. I was getting, one stage I was getting up to 700 euro for going to Fast, like, which is oh. unbelievable money back then. Like, yeah. yeah. And like, I was like, I got myself a good car and, but the first, the first job when I went to Cork, um, I got a new tool bag and everything and I was working above Knock Nahini. And we went back for lunch. We left the tool bag on, on the wall next to the van, came back. And all I could see was a young lad about 10 years of age running down my new hammer, new measuring tape <laughs> down the road. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I got a good taste of Cork City. Yeah, there you go, there you go. Yeah. Don't be leaving your tools around the place. First week's wage, went to a new tool, tool bag again. <laughs> well, you have to learn, don't yeah, you? No, yeah, it's just a yeah. learning curve, right? But just on that, John, you, you probably see it on your Wednesdays with PBC, just the difference of how, you know what I mean, that whole game has changed. Like, it, it yeah. probably the mentality that it is uh, physically exerting all the time isn't probably the case. No, 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 it's not. And, like, it depends. Like, there's so many different areas you could go into, even as a carpenter, like, you know, and I suppose you can kind of, especially work yourself, you know, you can kind of suit your own hours, a bit more flexibility and stuff, which is good too, like, but, um, you know, going back to your point earlier, like there's, there's very little people to do stuff now. Like, you know, even down my direction, like, you know, I suppose my dad's not a million miles off retirement, but he's he's so busy at the moment just because there's not that many people around anymore to do that kind of work. Like, you know, and 
I suppose that's kind of another someone have to do it. like uh, you know even when I'm older stuff that's probably another reason yeah. why I'd like there, to there's definitely going to be a shortage mm. the same as we're from the country as well not far from West Cork but you hear neighbours even getting on to myself like I'm a carpenter by trade but I'm so busy with the farming I try to take on only small jobs yeah. because if I take on the big jobs mm. I'm just putting myself under too much pressure with the farm and need time for family as well like but there's going to be a massive shortage even the same when I was in Australia like like the amount of Irish that have moved out there for better pay. There's better pay and obviously better lifestyle out in Australia. But um, they're going to have to do something because there's more houses going up and there's more people and less trades people. So something has to give. Yeah. What could they do? What would incentivize? Like you've been out there. You, you got the call to kind of come home because your dad and your family and the legacy of all of it. But the people you were with in Australia and New Zealand, we they'd have a grow for coming home too. What, they would. What would it so it was a bit easier for me, the transition, I suppose, because I was able to slot straight into the farm. Like the day after I came home, I was straight into farming and took over the farm within a few weeks. Like And whereas for Grace, she was used to going from Kudji into the CBD every day, getting her a cup of coffee with friends yeah. and then moving back to Kinmare and driving from Kinmare all the way up to Cork, an hour and a half each way, so three hours in the car. And she was like... We go back to Australia, so That's it was. I was. I went back playing GA with the lads hurling and football. I had a lot of friends that moved back and couldn't stick Ireland, and they went back. But I've had plenty of friends who missed home so much, and they love it here. But I'm very happy to be home with my friends and family, of course. But it's two different lives. It's hard to compare the two of them. Like the money in Australia was there was great opportunity yeah. there, and the weather, of course, is a big thing. But um, they just need to probably do something in secondary schools, incentives about doing maybe more classes around woodwork or yeah. trades and probably better pay. I know that better, you're getting paid not to go to college, but you're getting paid in the trades. They need to up their game some way because people are not going doing trades, like mm. so they have to change something. I, I, I think education is a massive side of it. Just actually showing people what goes on in a yeah. trade nowadays as opposed to what the perception is of a trade. Yeah. 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 Talk to us, lads. Uh, we've looked at it as a lack of kind of trades and and skills, but what about farming? What are you finding on that side of it and just people picking up like you did, you know, the legacy when it comes to the farm and, and running the farm or offsetting it to someone else? So, like, far, like, there's a lot of young people not going to farming as well. Like, when I go to the mark now, most days, 90% of farmers there are probably over 60, like most of them. There's a few young people, but um, there's no, say, incentives there to go farming. Say, for example, now, when I took over the farm, after spending a good bit of money trying to make it a bit more modern and stuff like that, so if a young person has to spend, whatever, up to 100,000 on the farm to improve it, to make things easier, but if they're also building a house, yeah, they're, they're probably going to choose the easy option, probably lease out the farm or maybe plant it. So a lot of young people know or either selling the farm, they're plenty for forestry to get premiums or going organic. So there's a lot more regulations and red tape come in and it's not viable at the moment. 30 years ago, there was every every house in the country was a full-time farmer. If you look back now, only probably a fifth of that. So imagine another 30 years' time, probably I'm lucky enough I can work full-time off the farm. Probably in 30 years' time, say if Dara takes over the farm, he might only have it part-time, might not be viable because... For example, for myself, the price of lamb the last few years has stayed plateaued, whereas our expenses has quadrupled. Like so, it's just only for the payments from Europe, it would be, you would not be making money. Like yeah, and the weather is everything as well for the farmer. Like of course, yeah, and that's yeah. not getting much better. No, it's not. It's moment. not getting much better. But but it is a tough way of life too. Like it's twenty four seven. It is a tough life, but it's like you have to be on on call. It's like a nurse or a doctor. Yeah. Like it's a vocation can't, without you, doubt. You can't take a day off. Like the sheep need to be fed if they're sick. And if you go in holidays, you have to have backup. I'm lucky I have the father, but not everyone is in that you know, scenario. Mm -hmm. Like so, do you do you feel the pressure, John, to kind of take over that role, or is it something that you'll kind of say in time? Do you know what? Let's leave it there. You know, Glenn here is eight generations, so I, I kind of understand it. So, like there's legacy and history to it. No, nah, like there isn't much pressure from my parents. In fairness, like, but. It's probably something I'd like to do myself, like, you know, maybe eventually take over what dad's doing, you know, as, uh, you know, maybe if he retires and, you know, I suppose when rugby, whenever rugby finishes up, like, it would definitely be something I'd be interested, definitely, like, mm. you know, maybe something I kind of hope to do, really, like, yeah. 
do you find you get calls from all the teammates or all the lads? You know what I mean? If something goes... <laughs> Small but yeah, 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 Are you yeah. the go-to? Uh, yeah, like, I, I, shit, it's the fan. <laughs> get John on the phone. Ah, uh, small bit. I'd, uh, I'd uh, hang a few tellies for a few fellas, all right. That was about it. And, uh, Shane Daly during lockdown. Yeah, what was the crack there? I, um, he, he's a house up in Limerick and uh, it's kind of this spare box room and the bulkhead of the stairs is kind of covering a good bit of, this, good, good bit of the room. So I kind of pulled something together, put some bed over it like so. I made a bit of a bed that goes into the bulkhead, if you know what I mean. Yeah, okay. So it kind of saves a bit of room in the in the in the room and stuff, and it's it's an extra bedroom for him as well, I suppose. So it is sandy out. Oh, lovely. <laughs> Probably a spare room though. So <laughs> yeah, there's yeah. no one in there at the moment. <laughs> Are you living with him? I am. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. myself okay. and Keen Hurley live with him. So, but like that is fairly decent to be able to help yeah, out your yeah. teammates and yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I, I hung a hung a telly for Rory Scan there a couple of weeks ago, so that that's still sandy anyway. So I'm happy enough. Yeah. <laughs> Because <laughs> I get a giggle, uh, Ron O'Gary used to need an awful lot of help uh, for, for stuff like that. And Dennis Fogarty, a bit like yourself, oh, would yeah. fancy rolling up his sleeves, of course, farmer kind of background as well. And Yeah, yeah. yeah but so it's, it's nice to give for a hand, like, you yeah, stuck, you know, and I suppose, you know, especially if you lads wouldn't wouldn't have any experience, you know, I suppose it's nice to be able to just, you know, chat them through it and, kinda, yeah. you know. What folks found out though was he was changing light bulbs. You yeah. know what I mean? Is that rocket? Yeah. yeah, that's a bit different <laughs> you, now again. <laughs> you don't need to trade or you don't need to have smarts <laughs> to change light sense, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and there's probably getting the balance in that. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, we were obviously chatting, Glenn, about the kind of skill sets, but what about managing everything? Like, of course, you, you, you were chatting there, like when it comes to finances, yeah. regulations, different things like that. There is an awful lot. You, you have to be a farmer, but you also have to have a business head. 100%, yeah. That's a massive feature now and you can't get away with anything now because you've revenue onto everything like so there's so much red tape so on the social say side of it and marketing I've talked down on board and I'm enjoying the online and all that okay. but my grace would be a bit shyer now and she wouldn't be interested in the camera which is fair enough yeah. but she's she went to UC and she's an accounting background so she does all the financing and all that and so managing accounts because with farming you're paid only towards the end of the year. So we'll go from January to September without any check come in, like oh. zero. So first payment probably when you sell the lambs and then you get payments from Europe then later on in the year. So you really got to manage your accounts and you have to have a rainy day front because yeah. if you don't, you'll be in the, you'll be in serious trouble. Like You have to be disciplined in that oh, though, you aren't have you? To, and sometimes sure you're fairly tempted to go off there and of when you have a good lump of money in the account, but you have to keep that for, for the next nine months, like until, you know. Yeah. Yeah, so there's a bit of managing in it. But I suppose the best thing I've done when I came home was the green cert. Every farmer needs to do the green cert. Okay. So I did it in Clannacilty, you know, where John's from there. They go through from driving tractors, driving quads, handling of cows and sheep, through the finances and everything, all the book stuff. And found that really good. But I suppose there's a lot of, lot of paperwork too with now with, that's coming in and regulations, legislation, red tape and all that everything that follows that is all money you yeah, have to okay. pay for doing these courses and all that and with the price of for myself lamb not going up and calves not going up beef it's you're spending more money but again, you're you're getting less money in like so yeah. it's just tough tough to take John how were, you, how were you on that side of it of course you like getting on the tools yeah but yeah you, yeah you, like I see with my dad like you know I suppose he's he's a carpenter by trade but I suppose when you run you run your own business there's just so many other things you wouldn't even think yeah. of like trying to manage I suppose the VAT and tax and all that and then pricing jobs and you know I suppose I know my dad's been kind of lucky in a way but you know sometimes it'd be tough to get money off people and stuff as yeah. well you know even like small things like that you know and I suppose that's not really what you sign up for when you're a carpenter yeah. but it's, it's you know it's part of the trade and I suppose you kind of have to adapt to it like in you know get yeah. to know those things if you want to run your own business that is a different skill set you yeah, know what I mean exactly, like yeah. even uh, managing yeah. that but uh, do you feel like your degrees have helped you with a kind of process of thinking or you, you like are you glad with the industries you're in now that you did go off and well, study well, to a third level for, for the carpentry trade definitely um, like only for me doing the trade when I, when I came home so I was away for was it six and a half years when I came back there was a lot of hairy things around the the yeah. farm that was would have been broken and fixed my my father so using the trade that way to fix up a lot of the sheds a lot of them would have been half blown down by storms and stuff and my father would throw a sheet of iron, iron over and maybe tire up on it to keep it down but would have fixed up a lot of stuff you'd be a bit more tastier do you know what I mean yeah. you'd you'd look at things different and try to make things last longer like of course. so it wouldn't be break as much but 
the trade definitely has helped big time, yeah, 100%. Farming has changed an awful lot as well. I just noticed with our kids, we had one of these family paths for photo. Yeah. So it just became so common that we'd go there once a week and enjoy it. So there's no novelty in a giraffe for my kids. You know what I mean? They think that is absolutely <laughs> normal. But I called down to my brother, Ulti, who lives on a farm in Kinsale. Yeah. And they saw a cow and they're like, oh, my goodness. And I'm there like, this is quite embarrassing yeah, for me. Yeah. But that probably shows that like every farm my kids go to know is nearly there's activities involved with it. Have you looked at those kind of areas, beekeeping, yeah. different ways to use the farm for like tourism? That's a lot of farms are going that way because farming is not viable for some farms anymore, especially small farms. Um, see, a lot of a lot of people are part-time now because it's just not viable. Yeah. But there's a few places near me who've done that and it's great to see. But our focus this year is to build a house. But next year and the year after, we were hoping to maybe do glamping pods because uh, obviously with the fields and all the mountains around us below in Kerry, people would love that sort yeah. of thing. But there was a few companies onto me, tourist companies, the last year and a half and they actually got onto me only a few weeks ago. Would I do... Um, like tours for Americans, so so they're if you, they definitely want Yanks coming onto the farm and <laughs> but so they wanted to bring on just mini tours. They go around West Cork and down yeah. around Ring and Kerry to do maybe a shearing demonstration, maybe dog trials, and other things, maybe feeding pet lambs or feeding wow. a few cows and take them up the mountain. So like, if we could reduce numbers and maybe make more money and less hardship, I suppose, yeah, of course, and have more time with family. If I can do that, maybe in the next few years, 100%, but definitely something along the glamping pods or the farm tours, definitely. Just work smarter, I suppose. Yeah, but it shows you have to adapt and move yeah. with, that's what people yeah. are looking for now. And Yeah, it's just having all your eggs in one basket doesn't yeah. work anymore. Like, if we have a bit of income coming in throughout the year for something like that, glamping pods wouldn't be a lot easier. At least you'd be getting a paycheck every week and then. Very true. So, yeah. like, it's just anything can happen. Like, the world is moving fairly fast now, so yeah. you have to kind of go with it. John, why can I see you togged out as a beekeeper? It's just yeah. in my head. <laughs> <laughs> we actually we do, we do. If we bees at home, right, You Jack. do not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the way I was yeah. slagging. Whoa. Uh, yeah, we have five or six hives maybe at home now. No way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, um, it's just for ourselves. We don't sell it or anything. Okay, yeah. Uh, we probably just have enough in the year for ourselves, but, um, Probably didn't have a great year this year because the weather and stuff, but we had one or two swarms as well. But um, in general, yeah, there's not nice to keep. Like, you know, there's, a, there's, there's not a whole pile of working bees either. Like, I suppose just when they're swarming, you kind of have to be careful. You know, you have to just to do a few bits. And I suppose in winter, then you have to feed them. Once you take the honey off them, you know, you kind okay. of feed them yourself then to keep them, keep them going. Well, is that something you'd look at? Are you, are you were looking at that more for hobby or... Are you a hobby, I'd say more, yeah. Uh, it is, I'd say it is, um, there's probably a lot of work in it, you know, going if you're going to go full time and it's tough, like, you know, because you can have bad seasons too, like in good seasons. So you kind of, um, it's more of a hobby really at the moment. And, you know, it's nice. It's nice to, it's another interest to have, like, and, yeah. you know, there's, there's a bit of crack going down to the bees, opening them up and having a look through, even though it's scary at times. Of right? course, like, yeah, yeah. yeah. If you see my girl, it, no, yeah. you probably don't <laughs> even remember that movie. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. <laughs> For people in pharma looking to build on that type of experience, though, it, like you, you have gone and upskilled in carpentry or whatever it is. Someone listening from that end, what would you say to them? What would be a little kernel that you would think, you know what I mean? If you can just add a skill level or maybe they're nervous about it, what would be your advice? If, if you have an interest in, and if you're good with your hands, I would definitely say go out of trade because the way there's a shortage of trades people know, like a lot of trades people are naming their price and you can make really good money. I know, like, do you know? Of course. Do you know, it's same with the farming, like, like a lot of people aren't going into it. They just need to make it an easier route into getting a trade, like, and yeah, because otherwise, like we said, they're going to be a, a savage lacking of, of trades people down the line. John, you're a good example of it, though. Like, you can't, unfortunately, at the moment, with your workload, but you're upskilling. You're doing things like, you were telling me you're welding at the moment. Yeah, isn't yeah, it? yeah. I suppose, I suppose I'd be slightly different to most, where it's it's kind of, you're kind of starting a new career again once you finish rugby, like, you know. But um, I suppose for me, it's just trying to, you know, upskill myself in, in everything I can, like, you know. And even if it is the welding, even though I mightn't use it once, or, to, you know, I mightn't use it much, but... I suppose it all adds up at the end, you know, and I suppose even if I do want to go into welding at the end of it, at least I have the kind of start made to it. I can keep going once I retire, you know, it's I won't be started from scratch. 
tell us, uh, Glenn, uh, plans for your channel. What, uh, what do you see? I suppose it? social media side of things is great. So if I do go down the route, whatever road I take, say for the clamping pods and maybe farm tours, the hardest thing people say is advertising. So at least if I've, there's over 70,000 followers now on wow. Instagram, which is great for a little lad on the side of the mountain in, in <laughs> Kerry Lake. But they say the hardest thing is advertising. So if I can get the business set up, I, sh- I have all the hard work doing. So hopefully with the YouTube channel now and Instagram, that if I do put on pods or whatever, they should fill up pretty fast. So that would be the the aim to to start up something like that, yeah. John, would you like to do more of it? Obviously, I know how hampered you are within it. And yeah, yeah, definitely. Like, uh, like, I suppose the more I do it, the more I like it. And I suppose the more I could see myself doing it when I'm older, like, you know, especially when, whenever rugby ends, like, and definitely carpentry be kind of top of my list, I'd say, at the moment, and things I'd like to do, like, you know, post-rugby anyway. We haven't chatted about rugby. Look, um, I knew my kids had a taste for rugby when we went to watch you play under 20s and they were like, that is a player. <laughs> and I was there, they can see it. You know what I mean? Because the work you do for your teammates is incredible. It's kind of, you nearly get lost within the work. Uh, you know, you always look at your stats, they're through the roof. Um, just tell us, what what are the goals and plans for you going forward? Personally, I feel you've been a little bit hard done, boy. <laughs> but um, where would you like um, to see in a few years? Definitely just stay on with Munster anyway. I keep playing away, like, you know, and I suppose becoming a regular starter with Munster, I suppose, would be a big thing for me. And staying injury free as well, like, you know, yeah. I've had I've had my fair share of injuries already, like, and I suppose those probably are the big things. And obviously, I'd love, I'd love to play for Ireland as well if, if that ever, that opportunity ever comes up. And, you know, hopefully, hopefully it will at some point, you know, and I suppose all I can do is just keep doing my best with Munster and, and whatever happens and after that will happen. It's amazing you say that though. Do you get nervous now about injuries? Like, um, like our generation, and not trying to distance ourselves, but everything that went on with head collisions, fellas probably weren't up to speed. Whereas you're kind of fully educated and up to speed. And the biggest thing for me is the athlete has totally changed. Yeah, like t- touch wood. No, I've never actually had a concussion, but you know that stuff is scary. Like you know all the brain injuries and stuff, and you know I suppose they are doing quite a lot now at the moment to try yeah. and minimise that, which is good. You know, good for us. Um, but yeah, injuries in general, like, yeah, from time to time, I would, I would get a bit worried, you know, cause you know, I suppose I've, I'd say I've maybe about two years of my career just alone with injuries. Like, so it's been a long time, like, and I suppose it's something you try to avoid if you can, but at the end of the day, like, like you said, there's nothing that much you can do sometimes. Like it is the nature yeah. of the sport too, like, you know, but it builds up a resilience as well. You mm. know what I mean? Yeah, for you to, com- to kind of come back. And yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think that's why it's so important, you know, say as a rugby player to have something outside of rugby. Like, I know I do a bit of carpentry or whatever, but, like, it mightn't have to be that. But it's definitely, you, especially when you're injured, you need something else. Like, you can't just, it's a long slog when you're injured, like, and you need to have a different interest outside of rugby you know, yeah. to get through it. I find anyway, and I know a lot of lads find the same. Well, lads, thanks so much for joining us on Under Construction. Really do appreciate it. Glenn, you might give your social media platforms a shout out for us. Uh, Sheep Shepherd. The Sheep Shepherd. Yeah, so we, we got a few calls now, so we'll have to <laughs> rethink the <laughs> name. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. That's all right, though. It's a great name. Don't uh, go no, too far yeah. away from it. But thanks yeah. so much, John. Continued success. Honestly, I can't tell you how proud I am every time you run out. Always put, giving it your heart and soul to every match and you're a beaut and I'm Really appreciative of you taking the time today. Thanks so much. Yeah, cheers, Les. Yeah, thanks, Millen. So, Les. Welcome back to Under Construction. It is now time for our Suppliers Corner. And um, I always need a good teammate, a good partner when it comes to it. And I'm delighted to be joined by Patrick Atkinson to take me through this. Patrick, thank you so much. Yeah, great to be here. Yeah, um, you're helping me for our Suppliers Corner. And today we're lucky to be chatting to Velux and we're delighted to be joined by Kevin Gavin and Niall Freshwater. Guys, how are you? All good, yeah. Thanks a million, Donica, yeah. Um, Very well, well, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, Kevin, you might take us through a brief company history. Sure, Donica, yeah. So, take you back to 1941. Um, The world, or the majority of the world, was at war at the time. Um, And there was a young engineer in Copenhagen or just outside Copenhagen by the name of Willem Kahn Rasmussen uh, and he established his own company. Uh, strange time to establish your own company, I guess, but there you go. Great name. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what a name. <laughs> um, and basically, one of his first jobs um, for as an engineer or with his engineering company um, was to survey a local school who were um, coming under pressure space-wise. So, um, you know, numbers were in the school were expanding, um, you know, 
space was tight, budgets were obviously tight given the times they were in. Um, and basically, he was looked to come up with um, a couple of ideas in terms of how could we get more um, capacity into the school, basically. So he had a look at the building from the outside. He noticed a pretty solid structure um, with a high roof pitch, climbed into the attic and said, if I can get daylight and fresh air into here, put a floor in, we have our space. Um, and basically, that was... That was the, that was the, the the genesis of it, if you like. And uh, his vision at the time was to make a skylight or a roof window um, that was just as good as the best vertical window at the time. Yeah, it, they're always the greatest ideas, aren't they? Out of necessity. Simple. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, his 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 motto at the time, and I think it, it holds true even now, was you know one experiment is better than a thousand expert views. Um, and that's probably the practical engineer coming out of him, I guess. But you know, I mean, if you think about it, it's. It's a uh, it's a pretty good place to start, you know. So, and from there, then really, it uh, so that that's how it started. And the first roof window then was patented in nineteen forty two, um, and from there it uh, it started, moved into West Germany. Um, he called it Velux, so the V E stands for ventilation, and the Lux is the Latin for light. So ventilation and light, which is what the product provides. So um, again, Serenus simple. in the face. Yeah. <laughs> simple. We should have all known that. Like every game of guess who I ever play. I, that just makes yeah. such sense now. <laughs> who knows where the company name comes from? I do. Um, It'll so never yeah, be so a pub quiz question. No, no, absolutely not, no. Um, but again, by 1965, was in 12 markets um, across Europe, really. In latter years then, moved into uh, Great Britain and Ireland, and then into um, the USA, Canada, and right now, it's a it's an organisation of over eleven thousand people across thirty five different countries. Wow! I think the nice thing about the company is, is your know, great heritage, great history, as, as as Kevin has said. But I think we are very on the on the on 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 the face of it, a quite a simple product. We are a, a window in the roof, and that's basically all we do. Yes, we have accessories, we've got other bits and pieces, but we don't sell a thousand construction products. We sell roof windows, and that's yeah. that's it. And it's 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 about what that provides, you know, people don't necessarily go out to buy a window, they go out to buy the like, in fresh air, they want a nice space as, you yeah. know, Kevin talked about our founder back in, in the 1940s. So yeah, yeah it's a really good heritage. Yeah, certainly over the last, whatever, it must be 50 years now you're in this country, it's become synonymous with roof lights. Yeah. Yeah, and, 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 you know, the, the brand is exceptionally well recognised. We, you know, we run independent surveys about, you know, brand awareness of people on the street, not just in the construction or the, you know, the, the guys who are listening to this, to this, uh, this podcast, you know, the white van man, as we call them, or but general awareness across end users, end users or homeowners is pretty high, to be fair, for a construction product sure. um, that, you know, maybe not everyone has the necessity to buy, but they're still aware of what it is or they know, they recognise the name, I guess, you know, so. So as we evolve, like we're all in building materials and, um, you know, sustainability has become a big part of the agenda for, for all of us. How is Velux dealing with that? I suppose the challenge for us as a, as a manufacturer um, and a supplier to the construction of homes is um, how do we make products that are sustainable themselves and that contribute to the sustainability of a home, but also that improve the indoor climate and the living environment of that home as well. We run our own independent surveys and, and our studies and, you know, the information we get back, Patrick, is that one in three Europeans are living in um, a, a poor indoor climate, for want of a better phrase. So that might be excess heat, excess cold, excess noise, damp, moisture, whatever the case may be. Um, so we would see a huge opportunity for our product to alleviate some of the strain that that type of environment puts on on the living environments of people, to be fair, you know, so. In 2020, we set out a, a, a 10 year strategy for how we can reduce our, our carbon emissions. So that's both reducing our own uh, or our, the, having the, the emissions in our supply chain. So our customers, our suppliers, et cetera, and our own. But then within our own business, getting that down to a, a complete reduction down to, to, to zero. So we're in a, a carbon neutral company uh, ourselves. And that's been, been quite a challenge because obviously it, it is quite a heavy industry. It, it can be quite a conservative industry and kind of getting it to sort of move on with, with things when you're trying to run a small business, for example, a small construction business, you know, getting involved in this space is, is quite is quite challenging. So the things that we're trying to do as well as sort of changing our own process, processes internally is also trying to inspire others and in how we can support, uh, you know, suppliers, um, smaller customers, et cetera, so, sort of do that. So yeah. it's about the leadership as well as looking at all the mechanisms for, for reducing our uh, our own sort of embodied carbon, for example, in our, in our product. Yeah, and I think that's the important thing. I think leaders within the industry <coughs> need to lead. Um, and we use an expression in our business that, you know, sustainability has become part of our DNA. Yeah, yeah. And I think if we don't do that and, you know, and, and lead the way 
way for others who are smaller companies who, who, who need direction. I think that's as important. So what you're doing is, is really, really, really good. These are the decisions where, you know, I think larger companies have that ability to invest and, 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 and make those commitments, but it's difficult for the smaller companies. So I think it is really important that the, 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 the bigger guys essentially, you know, as you've said, uh, Patrick, lead the way and, 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 show the, uh, and show leadership in this, in this field. Yeah, 100%. So you guys are famous for bringing light into dark spaces that <laughs> you usually sit up in an attic or loft. Yeah. So, you know, we've seen a huge amount of people start working from home now and they're looking for more space, quiet space and that. How has that impacted your penetration into the market, if you like. Have you seen have you seen any difference in, in sales? or <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. And I, I think we're kind of coming to the tail end of that now. So if we go back to, to COVID was kind of 2019, 2020, um, you know, obviously the thing, you know, everything was more or less shut down. Construction was only essential projects, stuff like that. But what we found from COVID, coming out of COVID, was an absolutely massive pent up demand Um and we saw that coming through in in the in the demand for our product and in in, in our sales volumes. Um, so you know, people working from home, they may have been sitting at the kitchen table for a couple of years. Mm. You know, I need I need to build a lean to extension out the back. Some of them using ironing need, boards. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. You know, uh, I need I need to get into the attic. I need to convert the box room. I just have to get off my kitchen table. You know, and um, and we were seeing huge. We we found huge pent up demand during that period, so much so that when we came out of COVID. Um, the challenge for us was actually supply. Um, the demand was there, but we we physically couldn't supply um, our product based on the demand that was there. So our lead times moved to like 8, 10, 12 weeks in some cases, depending on the product you were looking for, which traditionally is anything between three and five days. Um, well, so that was the, you know, the, the pandemic wasn't great for an awful lot of people. Um, it was good for business initially, but then the problem became supplying. And I think... That was, I think you'll you'll know better than I will, but that was the same across a lot of suppliers and and categories. I would yeah, say, yeah, yeah, it was a big issue. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you mind me asking? Like you mentioned, the history, the tradition of the product is incredible. Obviously, an awful lot of change to it, though, in the last while. When what what's new and what's the sure the trends, what's coming? Yes. Yeah, so, so so I guess if if we tie it back into the sustainability side of things, then so I guess the trends that we're seeing from homeowners. Um, and also from our installer customers, roofing contractors, um, is you know a move towards larger sizing. Mm. So um, on that on that daylight topic, if you like, you know I don't know about you guys, but I've I've never gone into a room and somebody says it's too bright. Yeah. But you've often gone into a room and somebody says it's oh, it's for dark in here. So we're seeing an awful lot of um, move towards larger sizes, mm. which is more daylight. Um, obviously. Um, you know, people are looking for enhanced technical performance. So they're looking for lower U values, um, better solar gain, enhanced noise reduction, all of that type of stuff. So they want a pretty high spec product. By and large, we're seeing a drive towards automation as well. So those windows that are out of reach, you know, that's in a vaulted ceiling, for example, it's not okay just to put them up there and leave them closed for 30 years. You know, they want they want to be able to open them, close them. Um, they want to put sunscreening on them via automated blinds, um, roller shutters, if, if if that's if that's what they're into as well. And then the smart technology piece as well. So, you know, our worlds revolve around our phones now. So people want to be able to control the products in their homes via phone. And and, and we've got that as well. So, um, yeah, so it makes it, uh, all, all the while yeah. it's made from sustainable material yeah. and, and low energy consumption, you know, so it's easy, really, you know. <laughs> Mine yeah. was always automated by the phone because my neighbour would ring and say, you left the Velux open <laughs> on the roof, you need to get back and close it, it's about to rain. The rain sensor yeah. should look after that. The rain sensor will kick in and shut yeah, the door. There's not a rain sensor on the outside. Yeah. So yeah. And, 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 and you were fortunate, you could just reach up and close it. Yeah. 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 for higher. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. As I said earlier, we're looking to cut the amount of carbon in our products by 50%. So that means, yes, wow. we can get recycled materials, we can start using cardboard packaging as we're now doing exclusively for our windows, but it also means we're probably going to have to redesign the windows. So even the windows that do the same job now, but doing it with, you know, um, you know, lower carbon requirements, etc., those products are going to have to be redesigned just to do the same job, but in order to make sure that they are, you know, more sustainable than they are today. So the window that you're putting in today will probably look different from the window you're putting in in, in, in 10 years' time, very much you know, in line with what Kevin's saying about the demand for, for greater light and, 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 uh, and, and better spaces. But I think we're, we're a good bit down that road already. So we've yeah. already got, say, for example, solar-powered automation on our windows. We've already got uh, what we call an active kit, where if the, if the temperature in the room gets too high, the window will automatically open. Or if the CO2 levels get too high, the window will automatically open. Um, 
and you know obviously we've got the app control and stuff like that as well and even if somebody has got an existing window that they want to automate we've got a solar powered conversion kit that you can fit to it as well that can operate it by, by remote control wow, so, very good too. yeah so there's uh, something for everybody yeah well look Vlux known for being innovative uh, been around for decades so look continued success to both of you thank we you certainly enjoy working with you in the Chadwick's group so appreciate that thanks, thanks for having us thank you yeah. thanks. thanks to see you cheers